Dzień dobry, witamy kolejną uczestniczkę. Ponieważ czekamy jeszcze troszkę na, na kolejnych uczestników, to ja tytułem wstępu opowiem, co się będzie działo pokrótce i jak działa nasze, nasze webinarium. Webinarium będzie trwało godzinę, czyli do 18. Możliwe, że skończy się parę minut po 18, bo też pewnie zaczniemy czuć później ze względu właśnie na wstęp i aby dać szansę wszystkim na dołączenie wszystkim. Webinarium będzie całe po angielsku. Za to, jeżeli będą, będą Państwo mieli jakieś pytania, coś będzie niezrozumiałego, to proszę pisać na czacie. Czat już tutaj, jak widać, został rozpoczęty. Na czacie jest również Maja Dobiasz, koordynatorka projektu, która bardzo chętnie pomoże w tłumaczeniu. Jeżeli pojawi się jakieś trudne słowo albo jakiś, jakiś trudny wyraz, albo któreś zagadnienie nie będzie jasne, to proszę koniecznie, koniecznie pisać, bo bardzo nam zależy, zależy żeby, żeby Państwo jak najwięcej z webinarium wy, wynieśli. I oczywiście, jeżeli będą mieli Państwo też jakieś pytania do, do Roxany, można też się zadawać po polsku. My tutaj postaramy się Roxanie je przetłumaczyć. Jeżeli też coś będzie źle słychać, będzie niewyraźnie, będzie za głośno, za cicho, to mogą Państwo dawać znać takim emotikonem, czyli nie wiem, czy widzą Państwo, tuż nad czatem jest taka buźka. Jak się na nią kliknie, to się rozwija taka lista. I na tej liście można po prostu zaznaczyć koło, koło ratunkowe, że potrzebuje się jakiegoś wsparcia, bo źle działa, albo poprosić od razu prowadzącą, że mówiła ciszej lub głośniej przy użyciu właśnie tych ikonek. Ja tutaj sobie zaznaczę, żeby Państwo to zobaczyli o co chodzi. Koło ratunkowe przy moim, przy moim nazwisku, a przy właściwie przy nazwie Centrum Edukacji Obywatelskiej pojawiło się takie koło. To oznacza, że potrzebowałabym pomocy. Myślę, że też będzie nam bardzo miło, jeżeli Państwo się przywitają i od razu powiedzą, czy dobrze słychać, czy nie dobrze słychać, czy jest dobre połączenie i też będziemy wiedzieli, skąd, skąd Państwo są. Myślę, że będziemy też powoli, powoli zaczynać. Oddam głos prowadzącej, która też powie parę słów parę słów o sobie na pewno, przywita się i zacznie część główną. You have been... So... I think we'll start. It's time for you. Um, if uh, if you have any problems, just let me know. I'm here, but I won't be. Uh, I just turn off my uh, my video and my audio for for time. This time is just for you and for participants. Wonderful. Hello, everyone. Um, and I am the assistant superintendent here at the Maplewood Richmond Heights School District. I will try to um, watch the chat, so feel free to ask questions as we go along, and I will try to pause uh, periodically in case you have questions. I'm very happy to be doing this presentation today and talking about something that we care very deeply about, which is educational equity. Um, and creating inclusive societies. And I'm sure you've seen kind of what's been going on in the United States recently. And so this is a topic that is very important to us as a school district. Um, you're looking at a picture of our middle school and high school building. We are here, just to kind of show you where we are, we are here in the middle of the United States, here in the state of Missouri. Um, and we are a school district uh, just within uh, the city of St. Louis, actually uh, in in a suburban area called Maplewood, Richmond Heights, that sits right on the city ring. And, and what that means is we're a very diverse community. So you can see that we are an urban landscape. The, the housing is really packed. 
Um, it's an older town, and so things are built very close together and looks very much downtown like it might have looked in the 1950s. You see that we have single family dwellings. We have lots of uh, housing development. So we have a lot of our families that live in apartments and older apartments. Um, and so you get an idea kind of of what the housing looks like um, in addition to some of the commercial areas. Our demographics are very mixed. We have about 1,300 students. Um, and about 50% are white and 50% are other minorities, with our largest uh, minority group being African American. Uh, we have a large number of uh, immigrant students. We have Syrian students. We have students from Africa. And our largest group um, are Spanish-speaking Hispanic students, usually from Central America. We also um, are not a wealthy school district. So we have about half of our students that are on free and reduced lunch status, which in the United States means that they are uh, well below the poverty line. What that really means is um, they make about um, $1,800 a month for a family of four, uh, which here is um, most of our students that are below that line are well below that line. And so we're starting to see a community of have and have nots. And so part of our challenge is how to uh, deal with that issue. We've developed some structures that I want to talk to you about today, but I don't want to get bogged down there. This first poster uh, we borrowed from some work from Harvard University. And this is how we think about schools. So what I'll point out to you here is but we believe that in addition to focusing on academic achievement, we also have to give equal focus to our educational environment. Because if we know that, that if students don't feel engaged, if they don't have supportive relationships, if they don't feel safe, um, if they don't identify with each other in the school, then we are going to have not much luck in, in the, the work of school. So we've developed a very unique way to do school. Um, we have what we call our cornerstones and our metaphors. You see that here. <coughs> um, our mission is that we'll create citizens, leaders, stewards, scholars. Um, but we do that through a very creative approach that I'm going to spend the rest of the uh, time talking about. This is all based on the idea that um, if we really focus on inquiry, if we really get students excited about learning, and if we close the opportunity gap by giving them opportunities to participate and interact with each other and their identities, that we're going to have a much stronger school environment. So um, again, these are some of the ways that we do that by providing experiences for students. And I want to talk to you about why we use uh, what we call metaphors. Um, each school has its own identity. And it's really a way to provide shared experiences that allow us to make sure that these students who are very different from each other have things in common that we can use to teach from. We also want to engage our students so that they're not just learning about how other people do things. They're, they're tackling important problems for their community and the world. And so we start off uh, very early with our Early Childhood Center, which is uh, School is Studio. And the idea here is that students learn uh, best through their experiences. So we can take what they are doing and we can find ways to connect to what it is that we need them to learn. Um, we have a partnership with the Reggio Emilia schools in Italy. And here's the idea that students learn through play. And so they have this idea that children learn through 100 languages, which is just uh, an interesting way of saying that we can take their, their touch, their senses, and we can show them how to learn. Um, this is a picture of our Visiting Farm Friends program. Since most of these students live in the heart of the city, uh, we have partnerships with local farmers who bring farm animals to campus, and they will live with us for about a week at a time. 
so that students get a sense of where food comes from, which is really important because many of our students uh, live in an area where fresh farm and healthy eating is not an easy thing to do. Um, we have garden space, so students grow, learn how to grow their own food from seed, and they learn about healthy cooking. Uh, this is a kids developed kind of an architecture and pulley system because they were wondering uh, how buildings are built. At our elementary school, school students um, learn through museum. So their metaphor is school as museum. And the idea here is that once students have a sense of self, that we really need to start helping them learn how to organize their learning, um, to build collections, to learn how to represent their thinking and how they're thinking about the world to other people. And so students become docents of their own learning and they put on exhibits both for their class. So here would be an example of them creating a display of why they think recycling is important for the building. Uh, but they also do museum openings for the community. So this is an example of fifth graders who were studying American history and they wanted to show their parents what they had learned about early explorers. And occasionally uh, we get asked to exhibit our work for the wider community. And so this was actually something that our second graders, and they, they do all the work themselves with some adult uh, assistance, but, but they really plan it and build it and do the work. Here's a video of students doing the work. Uh, they were asked to do a museum installation for one of our local museums. And so this particular exhibit, these are faces of all of our second graders, and this is about identity. They were really exploring the importance of knowing who you are and where you come from and the assets that each person brings to the community to make the community stronger. This is a, our most recent gallery opening in our elementary school. Um, students, again, do some really strong work. They're encouraged to tell their stories and to think about what they're learning through their own lenses. Uh, this one, we did this uh, just last month. This is a fifth grade class who is looking at different people's voices throughout history. And so they did a hot timeline of things happening in the United States with the different and various voices that would have uh, contributed to understanding. This particular wall is a uh, third grade classroom. These are all books that they wrote telling their stories and things that are important to their family um, and how their stories add to the community uh, collection and the understanding that we have together because of all of the family stories. This exhibit was probably the most moving for me. I don't know if you can see that very well, but uh, this particular class has several Syrian refugees that are part of the class. And so the class was really exploring the different barriers that folks can face when they move to a new community. And so we have opportunity here that they looked at, but uh, this particular gate that they built is to represent the language barrier and that it's very difficult to move to a place or to communicate when you don't speak the language, as I am experiencing now when I'm trying to talk to you in English and I'm, I'm seeing your chat in Polish here. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and talk about all four and then I'm gonna pause for some questions. Uh, our fourth, building is our middle school, and so we have this nice progression of um, school as studio, which is starting with young children and their self and how they're experiencing and learning about the world through play. Uh, then we have school as museum, where they learn to take the things that they're learning and organize them together and build collections together and represent something new based on what they've learned. Middle school is school as expedition. 
And so the idea about middle school is that we want to take our students outside of the walls of the school so that they start to learn how these things really work uh, in the wider world. So that it's not just us learning about things that happen that's disconnected for us, but that we can take the learning out into the world. And so our students uh, go on expeditions that sometimes happen at school, sometimes in the local community, uh, and sometimes farther out in the region. And so um, you're just seeing a couple examples here of the work that our middle school does. Uh, this is an adventure course or a team building course where students learn to get outside of their comfort zone and really challenge themselves, um, climbing towers and doing physical challenges. Uh, this student had never been outside of the city before, so she'd never been in the woods and was actually kind of scared just to be there. So to get her up on this ladder was a, a, a big deal. We have beehives here. Uh, students raise bees in addition to the gardens. Um, in this particular expedition, they harvested the honey and the wax, and they went to an entrepreneurship center and started their own nonprofit company. So they actually sell bee products. Uh, they took the money then and they looked at various problems throughout the world that they might want to help fund and they started a micro lending project so that they could lend money to folks who were uh, doing small business startups. This particular expedition, students uh, are, they're salamander right here. So they are uh, banding endangered salamanders as part of a science project. Um, there's another photograph of the beehives. I mean, I could talk, I could go on and on and on about things these kids are doing. Um, they noticed when they were growing their bees and trying to find out about their bees that there were no good uh, photographs of bees on the internet. And so they actually froze some of our uh, bees that had died and they dissected them. And so um, now if you Google uh, parts of bees, you're going to see all these wonderful cross sections that were done by our seventh and eighth graders. Um, they also do projects like uh, we have a, a project called the Vault, where they have um, taken artifacts from the school and the community, and they're actually archiving and preserving those artifacts. They are doing uh, community history interviews so that we can archive all of these stories that come from our community. Um, and then our high school is Schoolless Apprenticeship. And so the idea now is that because students have had these wide experiences in the community, they need to start thinking about what comes next for them and what, based on their interests and their experiences, they think are good next steps. And so in our apprenticeship program, uh, we try to expose students to a wide variety of college and career experiences. Um, we try to connect those, them with professionals that actually come to class and help judge their work, give them advice about how these skills translate to the workforce. Um, they do a lot of service learning projects, so they continue those projects in the community, and I'll talk more about those in a minute. And they also have the opportunity to work in apprenticeships uh, in businesses throughout the city based on the field that they want to go into. This is really important to us because many of these students um, don't really have a good idea of what's actually possible for them. They don't have a history of um, family members, for example, who've worked in fields that, that might be of interest to them. And we want them to get that exposure so that if they're going to invest in college, um, if we're going to work hard to get them scholarships so that they can go to college, because otherwise they may not be able to afford to go, that they're putting their time and their money in places that are really going to work well for them. Um, and so that is our metaphor trajectory start to finish. Um, again, the idea is really taking these students who live in, in, in many cases in poverty um, and providing them with a network so that everybody understands that everybody here counts, everybody has a story everyone's an asset, and that we can build on what they know through these shared experiences to help shape their future. So I'm going to stop there for a minute and see if we have any questions before we go on. Um, and I know I talk fast, and I'm talking in English, so I'm sorry.
Okay, I am waiting to see if I have questions. I still only see everything um, in Polish. I am trying to get it to translate to English, but not having much success. Oh, okay, saying go on. All right, I will go on. <laughs> All right. Um, so this model, I really want to call your attention to. This model is really important to us. Um, one of our cornerstones is educational excellence and equity. And so this is our equity model that, that we worked really hard on over the last uh, four years. And so we've drawn this as a series of rings because we don't think that the equity work or the social justice work is linear. Um, and so let me explain to you how this model works. It starts in the center, and in the center here you'll see so social and cultural identity. So it's our belief that our teachers and our students, actually everyone, it's really important that you understand who you are and that everyone has multiple identities. So I am a white female from the United States. Uh, my ancestry is Native American and Irish. Um, I'm a mom, I'm a college educated teacher, and all of those experiences cause me to think and act in certain ways. Um, my colleague and friend, the superintendent, is a, an African American female who grew up in an urban environment, and so her uh, come from is very different than mine. Our perspectives together often mean that we can um, problem solve in a much deeper way than any one of us could do. Uh, by ourselves. And so we really work on this with our staff and with our students. From there, we talk about cross-cultural understanding. So this yellow band is this need to have courageous conversation. Because we have different ideas and different backgrounds, sometimes we don't agree and we think about things very differently. So how do we do that? How do we have those conversations in a very productive way? The green band represents social justice and diversity. And so this band reminds us that we have to audit situations from time to time. We have to interrupt what's happening. We have to ask ourselves very deliberately for everything that we do, who's benefiting from that? Um, are all students being served or only some students? And if, if the answer is it's only for some, then we may have to interrupt that process and do something differently to make sure that everyone's benefiting from the programming that we're funding and what we're doing. The, the pink piece reminds us that in our teaching strategies that we have to be culturally relevant and that the examples that we use, um, the projects that we pick, the experiences that we provide um, need to be working for all of our students and that one size doesn't fit all. They're all going to need something a little bit different, and we have to be watching for that and responsive to that, which leads me to the responsive teaching or the differentiated instruction. We do spend a lot of time and money on professional development for our staff so that they have a lot of strategies that they can use so that when they notice they need something more culturally responsive or relevant, they have strategies that they can use to do that work. And we're also monitoring these things, which I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation. Are all students meaningfully engaged? Because we know that um, they have to be active participants. They can't just be passive. Um, that we, we need their energy and their thought process. Um, that we have to have supportive relationships. And that is, um, we work on relationships Student to student, can I enlarge this picture? Um, I don't know how to enlarge the picture, but I am going to try. Um, does that help? I think that might, there we go. Um, and so uh, supportive relationships um, are really about student to student staff to staff, and staff to home. And so we really work on all four types of relationships. Uh, safe and inspirational spaces are really important to us too. We know that if students don't feel safe in our environment here, um, that I've lost my chat bar. Uh, so if anybody knows how to get that back, that would be great. I can't see what's going on over there. Um, thank you. <laughs> um, we know that if uh,
students don't feel safe, both emotionally and physically, that they can't learn. Um, and the inspirational pieces are really important to us because remember that we have students that come from um, really disadvantaged backgrounds. And so we need a, a safe place. We need a place that looks like learning. We need a place that honors them and lets them know that they deserve to be in beautiful spaces that are designed for their work. We need our spaces to show them what's possible and to inspire them to do the work that should be required in those spaces. So we do spend and we do prioritize um, some money on our physical environment because we believe it really makes a big difference in terms of our climate and how students think and feel about themselves. And then finally over here, this institutional identity and attachment. Um, we spend a lot of time talking about individual identity, but we also have a collective identity. So we want our students to know what it means to be part of MRH and to be part of this community. We want everybody to feel a strong attachment to the community, and we want them to know um, that they belong here. All right. We spend a lot of time working in those environments. Um, and we spend a lot of time in addition to the regular instruction that everybody does. So I guess I should stop for a minute and tell you this. If you're listening to me, all of this sounds really wonderful, uh, but it's not easy. We don't have a lot of money. We're a school district that uh, most of our money comes from local and parent support. We do get a little money from the state and from the federal government, but we really have to prioritize how we spend that money and, and we make choices. Um, our teachers write their own curricula so that we don't have to spend a lot of money on textbooks and programs. Um, there are a lot of things we do without to make sure that we can provide these environments because we believe they're critically important. And so we go back to our models um, when we have to make hard choices about what we spend and what we don't spend. Um, it's also not a perfect environment. You know, we're, we're a, a, a mixed community that's living in a time period in American history where these are very hot topics. Um, St. Louis, um, has been in the news over the last several years um, with lots of issues, but we've made a determination that it's better to be honest about who we are and where we are and to work through those things together. And as a result, I think the community has um, really bought into that and they support the work that we're doing. Um, and so I, I want you to hear me say this is a very real place with very real problems that happen, uh, I'm sure for you, everywhere. We also have testing mandates. Um, and one of the things that I'm very proud of is when we started this journey, uh, this district had failing test scores and we were about ready to be taken over by the state. And it was because things were so bad that we made a commitment to the things that I'm talking about today. And within 10 years, um, we've made tremendous progress. So 10 years ago, um, we only had about 25% of our students um, that were proficient and advanced on the state test scores. Last year, we were between 85 and 95 percent of our students that were proficient. So in addition to being able to live out um, these ideals on a daily basis, we've had a substantial increase in our academic achievement as well. And again, I could go back to that first slide where I was sharing that um, you have to do both. You have to attend to the academic achievement piece, but you also have to attend to the educational environment. So what I'm trying to share with you today is our firm commitment, it involves everybody, and that we have to intentionally attend to not only what students learn, but how they learn, the experiences that we provide for them, um, the way that we help them understand how what they have to contribute matters to the wider world, and that kind of leads me to this slide, which is I told you we had cornerstones, stewardship, citizenship, leadership, scholarship. Um, we don't let that stop there though. We, we try to help students understand they have a responsibility to make that sustainable, that we have to thoughtfully use what we've been given to make the world better for those folks who live around us and those folks that, that come after us. Um, and that plays out in a variety of ways. Uh, I've alluded to the fact that we have a healthy eating 
uh, campaign, which we do. Um, we have local universities and local farms. We, we've made a determination to help our students understand where food comes from and how important that is for a healthy lifestyle. And we do multiple projects around that. Um, our students are engaged in service learning. Um, and so this is, these are our high school students that have been very involved um, through the VFW, which is a veterans association, working with our elderly in the community. And um, we bring them in periodically for luncheons with the high school students so that we can talk about um, projects that might benefit both. Our elementary school has a partnership with a retirement community in the area, the Gatesworth, and they've adopted the school. And so we have people coming from the retirement home to the school to work in our gardens, to read to our students, to work in our libraries. In return, our students visit them and they will do, um, they'll sing and, and do various programs and service for the people in the retirement community. So it's very important to us that we're connected to our city to our community and, and what goes on throughout. Um, back up a little bit and talk just a little bit more about Seed to Table. And I, I told you that because our kids live in what is sometimes called a food desert in a part of the city where it's hard to get uh, fresh produce um, and unprocessed foods, that we actually have uh, someone on our staff who's a nutritionist and she will help students grow food um, they will harvest food, they'll learn to cook food, they encounter farm animals. You can see this little guy here, it's the first time he's seen a horse. This is one of our visiting farm friends. Here's one of the ducks that comes to visit. They also do composting, so they have vermiculture with worms. Um, I've mentioned the bees, we have chickens on all of our campuses, so we have uh, urban chickens that we're raising in the city, um, all because we really think this healthy living is, is an incredible part of our students' learning and also their future. Here's an aquaponics lab. Uh, this happened because uh, one of our middle school students got interested in how this whole cycle works. And so um, they were able to write to some folks at a university to ask how that might work. Um, we were able to get a series of small grants that funded all of this. So a lot of our work that I'm talking about, again, I told you we don't have much money. Uh, we, we try to find ways to find grants and sponsors of people who are interested in who will help us. And, and our community almost always comes through because they know somebody who knows somebody who knows somebody. But in this particular project, um, the students set all of this up. This is in our basement. <laughs> So this is a grow bed that grows uh, vegetables. We had pineapples in here last year. And it's running off of this tank, which has actually got fish in it. And so the fish grow in the tank. The water is cycled into the grow beds. It cycles back down and goes back into a third tank that you can't see that sits over here. Um, and the whole thing is a self-sustaining um, system. The kids built it. They did the research on how it works. They use the herbs and the fruit in our cafeteria. Um, and this grew into multiple other projects. So when folks heard that we were doing this, um, we had someone from the Mushroom Council that contacted us. And they taught the kids how to grow mushrooms in this environment. Um, and, and the kids were able to develop recipes and learn about different things with the mushrooms. And then uh, over one of the breaks, they accidentally killed all the fish because the balance got off, right? So that happens. So we had them investigate how to bring that system back up. And what they found out was we had a need to grow a different kind of fish that would feed a local endangered species here in Missouri. And so they partnered with our local zoo and they have been growing uh, fish that will feed what is what is in English called um, a hellbender, which is a type of salamander. Um, I think that project has come to an end now, and so now we're trying to reimagine what they might do with this space, but that will really be up to the students and what they determine the next problem that they want to tackle is. That's just one example of how the kinds of things that we're doing that always sound exciting and people get really excited about 
are really about making sure that we're meeting our curriculum standards and that students are learning. It's just that we believe we have to connect the learning to important problems uh, for the learning to be relevant to students and for that learning to go deeper. So we do have lots of curriculum connections. Um, I want to talk to you just a little bit about how we do that. This is from an English uh, language arts class. And so the students were reading um, in their language arts class about, there's a book called Seed Folks, um, which is about community gardening. Um, but they were also talking about throughout history how gardening was done differently. And that got them really interested in what are called heirloom seeds, which are plants that um, are not necessarily native anymore because of um, genetic remodeling and so they wanted to preserve some heirloom seeds that had not been genetically modified and so they grew some things in their garden they harvested the seeds they developed the seed packet so as part of science they're doing scientific drawing so they're trying to do their seed packets they wrote um, practicing their nonfiction writing skills they wrote descriptions of all of these heirloom seeds and they work with the local library here in the community um, so that there is a seed library. So that means any citizen of Richmond Heights or Maplewood can go to the library. They can, in essence, check out these seed packets and take them home and grow them in the hopes of perpetuating um, these heirloom seeds. Um, so just lots and lots of examples of the various curriculum connections that we're making with our community. Um, we also do a lot of service learning. I mentioned the food project, but kids uh, have business models. They sell at our local farmer's market. Um, we have uh, bands that play throughout the community. Uh, at community events all the time. Um, actually, our jazz band was asked to play nationally. Um, we worked with the National Park Service and the students built public service announcements for all of the remodeling that's happening at the Arch. But I guess uh, the projects that I am most proud of are when our students really started looking at significant need in the area and they went even deeper. So this particular food project, as students were working on that, they realized that we had um, probably, we have 1,300 students in the district, about 70 families that um, their students depended on the free breakfast and the free lunch that they get at school. And that when they went home for the weekend, they didn't have any food to eat. And so the students created a nonprofit called Weekend on Wheels. They collect thousands of pounds of food um, and they box them up. And every Friday, students and teachers deliver boxes of food to families that get them through the weekend until they can get back to school on Monday morning. Um, all right, I'm seeing some questions here. Um, and so a question is, do you ask children what they want to do or is it parents' choice? Um, well, we have a set curriculum. And so every student in every grade has some things that we have to teach them and we guarantee that they're going to learn. Uh, but students often have a lot of choice in how they're going to learn that and what they're going to work on. So um, the students and the classes themselves make decisions about which of these uh, projects they want to undertake. Um, and so it's a balance of there are some things everybody has to do because that's part of the learning, uh, but there's a lot of choice in how they go about doing it. And some of these projects take on a life of their own. And so we have students who are much more involved in some projects than others. Um, I hope that answers your question. Um, parents um, aren't usually involved in the decision making about the projects because it really drives from the students, although we do um, have a great relationship with our parents. We encourage parents to talk with us about uh, any concerns that they might have. 
and we have parents in a lot working as experts that help students um, with the various projects that they're working on providing professional level expertise. So for example, we have a movie actor that just moved back to the area that's from here, um, been in several Hollywood movies. So he's been in working with students on uh, preparing some of these public service videos and how to put together storyboards and videos. Um, and so that would be one example of how, how parents and community members are involved. I hope that answered your question. If not, uh, feel free to keep typing and I'll, I'll do my best to answer uh, some more. As I mentioned, we really try very, very hard to stay closely tied to our community. Um, we've done water projects, which have worked on um, this whole watershed idea and, and making sure that we've labeled all the drains so that folks know um, the importance of uh, runoff and, and proper disposal of pollutants so that we're keeping our drinking sources safe. Um, we also do home visits. So every student, every time uh, we they get a new teacher, so typically a student stays with the teacher for two years, we loop. Uh, every time they get a new teacher, that teacher before school even starts does a home visit and goes to the child's home and meets with the parent and the child for the purpose of finding as much as they can out about that family and that child, what they like, what they don't like, what they hope to accomplish, um, their strengths. Um, and that home visit program is very, very popular. Um, we do pay our teachers, I think it's uh, $25 for each home visit they complete because they are taking their own time to spend a couple hours with each family. Um, we grant funded that for a lot of years. The grant funding ran out and our school board decided that that was still a very, very important part of this community connection that we want. And so we've, uh, in the last several years, found a way to make room for that into our budget. Um, but there are several other home visits that happen throughout the year that, that our staff members just do because we value those relationships. But everybody's guaranteed a visit every time they get a new teacher before they go to the class. Um, we also have a nonprofit that we share with the community called Joe's Place. It's a house that's about a block from our high school that is a home for homeless boys. So we have several students in our school district that are homeless. Um, they're sleeping on people's couches. They're uh, in shelters. They are bouncing from place to place. And as you can imagine, that's very difficult to continue their schooling. So we have house parents. And we have room for up to six students at a time. And they live there and um, are given some stability. Um, we've graduated a number of kids out of that program. They've all gone on to college or the military or meaningful full employment. Um, it's one of our huge success stories. We actually have a documentary out, I think you could get to through YouTube, called um, Joe's Place, if you're interested in how that works. We actually own the property, but all the money for its maintenance is raised by community nonprofits, heavily supported by um, our area institutions and churches. Um, but um, just one of the ways that we're we're taking care of our community and our students. Um, you can see a picture of our community gardens, um, very, very popular. So some of our gardens are maintained by our students. We have a couple of our campuses that are community gardens where people from the community can come in and main, help us maintain gardens and actually take the produce in, and use it at home. So we have a wide variety of ways that we connect with the community in terms of our gardening uh, project. Here's an example of our spaces, and if I can explain this just a little bit here. Uh, this is inside one of our classrooms. So we had buildings that were built in the 1920s, and rather than gutting them and making them very institutional, if, if the part of the room that you can't see would have very traditional desks that could be put in different configurations, but each of our classrooms also have seating areas where students can sit and think. Uh, we tried to maintain the original uh, cabinetry. Um, each space is designed for the learning that's going to occur. This is our ECC outdoor playground. Remember learning through play. So we've recreated their town. There's a fire department and a post office. Places where they can 
connect. Back here is the barn where all of those visiting farm animals stay when they come to us. Uh, this is our commons. Uh, less than five years ago, this was as it was concrete and asphalt. There were lots of industrial tubing uh, that was in here. It looked very um, run down and polluted. And so we gutted all of that out to create green space. This is now a community space where we hold concerts. We can do outdoor learning. Um, and again, that didn't happen overnight. It's 15 years of effort. We have to uh, get some community dollars and support and do a little bit at a time. And then we keep bringing them in to ask them what's the next thing uh, that they want us to do. What, what's the next thing that will help us achieve the vision that I laid out in those posters at the beginning. So what is next for us? Um, well, last night we were here until about 10 o'clock last night with representatives and parents um, looking at our middle school and high school. Uh, we're finding that lots of people are moving here because of the work that we're doing with children, that they appreciate um, how we do school and the fact that we care about equity for all of our learners. Um, that is a great problem to have, but we're starting to have more people than um, than our buildings can support. Uh, last year, our voters allowed us uh, to begin building onto our early childhood center to make space for our uh, elementary learners because we have a lot of kids there. All of those kids will be coming to our middle school and high school probably within the next five years. And so we're starting to plan to see how we might do that better um, and how we might really work on apprenticeship better. Um, it's just an ongoing task. And again, in the environment in the country right now, it's critically important that we stay connected to our community and that we continue to talk to each other and that we really prioritize and value um, what's happening for our students. Um, that's really kind of the overview of what we do here. I'm happy to talk, answer any questions you have or talk more in depth about any particular piece. I know that was really fast, um, but I think it gets to the heart of who we are and why we do school the way that we do. It's because we value diversity um, and we believe all kids can learn. So Maya, um, are there questions that, okay, one question. Finance, okay. Private or state owned. Okay, um, this is a public school. So uh, we are completely financed uh, by public funds that come. Uh, Mostly, I would say uh, probably 80, 85% of our funding comes from our local community. So that is taxes that people that live in the city pay so that their students can attend school here. Uh, we get a little bit of money from the state and we get a little bit of money from federal programs, but for the most part, um, it is completely up to, to public funding. Um, so we're not a private school. People don't pay tuition to come here. We take every student that lives in the area. Uh, we are required by law to take, and we do that, um, which always makes it interesting. When we get a lot of people moving to come to your school, there's no new money. So we, we just keep stretching those dollars as best we can. Another question. How much time does a teacher spend in school weekly? Um, each of our teachers uh, are here physically present about seven and a half hours every day. Uh, within that seven and a half hours, they have a half an hour um, for lunch that is not, there are no duties associated with that. They also get about an hour of planning and preparation time for the next day. 
So the other six hours are spent directly with students, either teaching classes or um, taking, you know, leading expeditions, supervising students in some way. Um, that does not include the time that they spend at home and at night and on the weekends preparing for classes. So um, our teachers, we tell people when we interview folks, and I'm very honest with folks, if you work here, it's because you, you have a, a mission. You, you really care about kids and you understand how we work and how we want to work um, and that it is going to be kind of a commitment, a life, a lifestyle commitment beyond maybe other schools that you could work in. And, and we have folks who really believe in what they're doing. We have exceptional teachers. We couldn't do this work without the commitment of our teaching staff, and I'm very appreciative of them. Uh, let's see, are we, what are we doing to promote their activities in the region open doors? Um, well, let me answer that in a couple ways. Uh, we, because we expect so much of our teachers, because we believe that they're the leaders that make all this go, we have prioritized um, a lot of the money that we spend on professional development and continuing education for teachers. So we spend a lot of time doing teacher training uh, here for them, either in the summer and in the district. All of our teachers here get four years of guaranteed training. So the first year we teach them how to write curriculum. The second year I bring them back in and we talk about knowing your students really well and how do you differentiate instruction and, and do culturally responsive teaching. In the third year, they get training on the metaphors and how you do school through each of those lenses that I talked about. And in the fourth year, we really go deep with the identity and the social justice training. So we don't just let teachers um, bring them here and hope it works out okay. We really give them a lot of support. We'll invest a lot of money in them if, if they're willing to do it. Um, and we do try to, um, I don't like to toot our own horn, that's not why we do the work, but we do present at a lot of um, state and national conferences because we feel like sharing our story is important and we learn so much from the people that we share with. Um, I always learn more from the people I'm communicating with than I feel like I'm sharing with them. Um, how do we plan our actions? Well, that's a great question. Uh, we have several shared uh, planning groups, and so um, the principals meet together for an hour two times a month, and they meet one-on-one -on -one with the superintendent and myself once a month. So they have their individual coaching meeting where I strategize with them one-on-one, -on -one, and then we meet together collectively uh, for uh, about a total of four hours a month in two separate meetings. I also have a group of teacher leaders that meet with me once a month, um, and we meet a half a day. So they come from all of the buildings, and we look at the models that I just shared with you and whatever problems are in front of us, and we problem solve. And then I try to equip them with strategies that they can use to go back to model the same type of problem solving with their staff. Um, we also have a group that meets once a month with me that is the curriculum leaders, so the folks that are looking at the academic performance pieces. They will meet with me once a month to bring forward what they're working on and, and any questions or problems. And then I have another group that meets with me once a month that looks at professional development. So what type of learning do the adults need and are we providing that correctly or are there other things we need to do? Each of those are designed as loops where they can bring problems forward and we can send uh, solutions back. So hopefully we have lots of open communication that's flowing in multiple ways to keep us moving forward. And then in addition to that, uh, every year we have multiple community forums that meet so that we're bringing in our families, um, business people, so that we're continuing to make sure that we know what our community wants and expects. Uh, how did we start this way of teaching? Is it a collective decision of teachers and supervisors? Well, Maya, um, as I mentioned, the schools were failing. The state was going to take them over and the district was going to cease to exist. And so something very dramatic had to happen. So the school board at that time, which would have been uh, parents who are in charge of overseeing that the schools running efficiently, sought out uh, two leaders and they were very specific that we have to make a dramatic change. 
And so the metaphors, the idea was if we think about doing school in a very different way, hopefully we'll get a very different result because they knew they couldn't keep doing what it was that they were doing. So the idea that we would have metaphors and that we would do it differently was actually um, developed by a very small group of people. But then all of the teachers and community members were involved in helping to determine what those metaphors were going to be and how that was going to look here. And as I said, that's a 10 to 15 year commitment that continues to evolve. So how they look today probably are not going to be how they look a year from now or certainly not five years from now because it's something that we keep coming back to together. Um, all right, next question. Whether your action fits into general ideas such as global goals, you realize task and cooperation with other schools. Yes, yeah, so we, um, as I mentioned, are still accountable for, in the United States, we have um, academic standards, so we're still accountable for all of those academic standards. Um, we participate in networks with other schools, both in the state and uh, through lots of um, professional organizations in the United States like the National Council for the Social Studies, the National Council for Teachers of English. Um, we talk about um, the, the global goals and global initiatives and those are part of our um, Cornerstones classes. So it's something that we talk about a lot. Um, we're not in a bubble here. We, we still have all of the same ideas uh, that everybody else has and, and we're still, you know, when we take the the PISA test or the TIMS test, you know, we we still see our scores go up on a national and international stage. So it's very important for us to know that that what we're doing fits into a larger context. Uh, someone says that in their school they have a didactic garden, but they would like to expand it. Right, um, you know, the, in the, the biggest challenge for us here was we were able to get startup grants to start a lot of these things, um, but now we have to think about sustainability because everybody wants to give you money to start something new and wonderful. Not very many people want to give you money to keep doing those things that were really good. So we had to be really creative about how to maintain and expand our gardens. Um, we found that Local garden clubs have been a huge help and they'll give us a little money here and there. A partnership with a nursing home where we had ready labor that would, would want to come over and do some work. Um, nutrition groups have helped us, food groups have helped us, the communities pitched in and made things happen. We have Boy Scouts. Um, so I encourage you, whatever whatever's on your mind, there's always a way to do it. It just sometimes takes a lot of creative problem solving to get there. Uh, and organize a research station. Did you do it in a DIY? Yeah, absolutely. Everything that you've seen here, I'll go back to the aquaponics lab. Uh, we built it in a basement under one of the, in, like in a shed um, with spare parts that people donated to us based off of a book that we got from a professor. And as we started building it and people started hearing about it, uh, more um, I guess correct or proper material started showing up one piece at a time. So pretty much everything that we do here, uh, we do with the end in mind, but we are very creative in terms of how we find the materials and the manpower to make things actually happen. Do we have any problems with students? Well, yes, of course we do. Um, no place is perfect. Uh, we have students that don't want to come to school on time. We have students that don't come at all. Um, I guess I should mention we have a really well-developed student services program here. So one of the things that we decided is that all kids can learn, but all kids don't have the same needs. So we got really serious about six years ago of understanding student profile. So students that have social emotional issues, we have substance abuse issues with students that are having issues with drugs and alcohol. Um, we have students that live in some pretty bad areas and are living on the streets, and so they sometimes show up to school with guns and knives. Um, this is not a perfect place. But we've tried uh, very hard to understand restorative justice practices. And so when we find students that have these needs, we have uh, a program called SAGES 
where students with severe social emotional disturbance issues go to that program instead of regular classes to learn self-regulation skills. And once they develop trust, we will transition them back. Maybe they'll be in the program half a day and they'll be in regular classes half a day. We have an alternative learners program where kids that just for whatever reason don't fit in a normal class go to the alternative spaces and there are programs designed for them. So um, yeah, we have all of the problems that I think every bear, everybody everywhere has. We just doing our best to try to figure out who these kids are. Um, and we see the symptoms, we see the violence, we see the bullying, we see the things that happen. We wanna go beyond that to get to the root cause and then find a way for the student to restore the harm that was caused to get them back on track. Um, did you not have resistance from parents when introducing your actions? Yes, early on, people were very upset. Uh, they didn't understand what we were trying to do. I understand that at one point they even burned a, a, a mannequin, a, a effigy of the superintendent in the street saying that she was um, trying to you know, ruin things. But I think that our success spoken from our, for ourselves we have really strong community support. I think, I think we have really strong community trust. Um, when we start new ideas, we try to invite people in to explain what we're doing. We have open forum and board meetings. Um, our board members are really good about responding to parents and people know they can call them. Same thing with uh, the superintendent and myself. We have an open door policy, so our doors are always open. Um, and when we have resistance and we have problems, we ask people to come in and we sit down and we, we talk through it. Um, and again, things aren't always pur purpose. That sounds easy. It's really hard when it's happening. Uh, but we're a community and that's, that's how you solve problems in a community. I think our last tax levy, uh, our last two big things we put on the ballot have passed with over uh, 76, 80%, which is unheard of in the United States. So we, we take that as a strong sign that we have our community support. Uh, what about disability? Yes, um, we do. So we have uh, students of all ranges of disability. We have special education students. Um, that we have a student here that's on our high school campus that is in a wheelchair and is completely nonverbal. Um, so it's full inclusion. Um, we have uh, we have students here with severe both physical and uh, mental disabilities. We have students from multiple languages. Um, we do have, uh, so you have ASL, I, I I'm not sure I know what we call it ESL here, I, I, but we have students that don't speak any English. So I have first year students from Syrian refugee camps. I have students from Africa that don't speak English. I just got last Friday two students from Central America that don't speak English. So we have uh, newcomer or full inclusion classes. I hired two English as a second language teachers. Um, we have a full complement of special education teachers. Um, and again, we form individualized education plans for those students. So our guarantee is every student gets our full guaranteed curriculum. If there are things that we cannot do, we write specific education plans for those students so the parents are fully informed and we're making um, the right choice for that child. Uh, students do not meet, in the, yeah, uh, I, I actually um, worked in an environment like that before I came here where students lived far from school and it was hard. Um, I would say my best advice is making sure that you have open communication loops and so we found that we were really good at sending information to parents but our loop of how parents could send information back was weak, so we worked really hard on two-way communication. Uh, not every parent can come to school. Not every parent has the transportation or their work schedule, so we started looking for multiple ways that we could have student voice. Um, we've tried things like journals that go back and forth that the teacher can write in and the parent can write in. Um, we've used video a lot and we have a school YouTube channel where folks can get information about the school. 
Um, we have question and answer places on our website where folks can send in questions to the superintendent or the principals. It is hard. Um, one of the benefits we have here is, you know, we're not very many square miles, and so everybody's right here within reach. So I, I do understand, and I wish you the best of luck in all of the avenues that you try. Uh, we use Edmodo and online journals, but YouTube is a, is a great idea. Yeah, we have a couple different online platforms that we use as well. So I would say any and every way that you can. We have a Facebook a post for the school. We do have Twitter accounts. So uh, I'm, I'm getting to the age where I have to turn that over to my younger staff so that they know all the cool ways to connect with people. Um, last question, Maya says. And I am waiting to see what that last question will be. Is there one more? Okay. Um, do you have any lessons about deaf culture? Um, I think the answer to that is no. Uh, of all of the um, student types, I don't know that we, well here, I don't know that I've ever had a student who was completely deaf. We do have um, audio assisted devices that will allow teachers' voices to be protect, projected with students with hearing disability, um, but that is not something in my time here we've had to explore, although as a teacher I had a student that was deaf with a, with a deaf interpreter, so I'm afraid I don't have any advice. Um, all right, well, Maya is telling me, I'm going to hang up my phone here for a minute. Maya is telling me that we are at the end of our time. I enjoyed myself. Thanks me ramble. <laughs> Thank you, Roxana, very much. This was, this was great. Uh, uh, for me, it was great. I hope for our <laughs> participants also. That was a very inspiring meeting. So thank, So thank you very much once again. And thank you for, for you all. Dziękuję bardzo. Bardzo się cieszę, że tyle państwo się, że udało się państwu dołączyć i mam nadzieję, że skorzystali państwo z, z webinarium. Już zapraszamy na następne. Więcej informacji na pewno prześlę Maja Drobierz wkrótce. Myślę, że kontakt do, do prowadzącej będziemy mogli jak najbardziej Yes, I just <laughs> told the participants that you will share the contact to you. So, yes, now you have uh, uh, mail to Roxana. And I guess that's all for tonight. <laughs> Good night and have a nice week. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.